Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. When preparing for a new school year, most people focus on performing well academically, what clubs or sports they will join, making new friends, and probably most important of all, what will I wear? What most people take for granted when it comes to school is proper nutrition, whether it comes from school-provided lunch or meals brought from home. Each year, parents and caregivers unintentionally decrease the safety of their children's packed lunch, leading to foodborne illnesses that result in approximately 48 million people getting sick. Of course, no one wants their children to be sick, and to know that they may be the cause of the illness makes the situation even worse. This is where our next guest comes in. Meredith Carruthers works with the USDA as a food safety and inspection service specialist and will discuss, among other things, some simple steps we can take to keep our food safe at home and in school. Ms. Carruthers, welcome to Instruction Discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, no, it's definitely our pleasure to have you here and to have to talk about something this important. Again, I think a lot of people take food safety and for, and nutrition for granted, but it's definitely something that we need to really uh, spend some time focusing on. So before we get into the whole the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, and, and pardon the pun, meat and potatoes of everything, and tell us, how does one actually become a food safety and inspection specialist? Sure. So I, um, when I went to college, I got my undergrad degree in dietetics, which has to do with food and nutrition. And I was always somewhat interested in that topic, clearly. Um, And as I started getting through my studies, I realized I didn't so much want to be a registered dietitian as much as I wanted to be able to communicate messages about health and wellness and, you know, do a little more out in the community. So I went to grad school, got my master's in public health and landed this job at Food Safety and Inspection Service, where I get to educate consumers about the, you know, foodborne illness and keeping themselves safe and protecting against foodborne illness, how they can do simple things in their own homes to prevent something that's so preventable. So that's how I, um, kind of, you know, worked my way over to here. And it's the perfect niche for me with food and nutrition and promoting safe handling, you know, information and messages about health overall. Great, great. That's perfect. And so since you you, you talked about it a little bit, how important is it that we practice uh, safe food handling procedures at home or even in school? It's very important. I mean, like you mentioned, it's, it's some t- something that we can kind of take for granted sometimes and think, oh, this little tiny step may not make that much of a difference or I did this once and nobody got sick. So that means I can do it again. But foodborne illness can be quite serious and severe in certain circumstances, and especially for children who are considered an at-risk population, which means that they're more susceptible to getting a severe foodborne illness than an adult or somebody with a fully healthy and uh, developed immune system. So it's important to try and prevent that as much as possible. You know, I'm sure most of us have experienced foodborne illness in some way or another, you know, in the time that we've Um, you know, grown into who we are, but it can be as simple as passing some symptoms at home on your own, or it can be as severe as hospitalization and death and other complications and things that we just really don't want anyone to have to go through, especially when you can take these small steps at home to prevent it. Now, you just mentioned that, I mean, foodborne illnesses for the most part come because of can be very simple things that that happen at, at a home or how you take care of certain things wh- wh- whether you're washing hands or something like that but where on this spectrum of 
I guess, illnesses or the like that are based on food, would a food allergy, for instance, fall and how as far as severity and how it can be communicated? So food allergies are a little bit different than mm-hmm. foodborne illness, but ultimately still a safety risk when you think about it. So an allergy is more of a reaction to an adverse reaction to a food um, that somebody has, you know, they're allergic to a different food or food product and allergies can differ in severity or, you know, they're on a scale of severity. Some might have a slight allergy where they just get like slight symptoms, like a scratchy throat and whatnot. And other people can go into full-blown anaphylactic shock and need an EpiPen or something even more serious. So it, it, it depends, depends on the person, the allergy and how severe it is for their body. For foodborne illness, foodborne illness can affect anybody. It doesn't matter if you, you know, allergies, if you have the allergy, it affects you. If you don't, it won't. Foodborne illness can affect anyone. Um, it can make anybody sick. It it depends on, you know, how much bacteria you eat or ingest versus if your immune system is a little run down that day or if you're more immunocompromised than just being, you know, in a certain age group. So it, it's, it's a, you know, wide spectrum of things, but foodborne illness can affect everyone. And I think that's one of the main differences from allergies. Just to, again, just to kind of put a bow on this particular topic, because I know we have, there are a lot of terms that, dealing with allergies and allergens are out there now. So you have, especially when it comes to nuts. So you have the the allergy situations where they just want to ban all nut born foods and then you have nut aware. So is there a, what's the the difference there between just a, a complete ban on all foods that have any types of nuts in them or those that are those uh, environments that have become more nut aware? So we don't go too, too much into food allergens in our food safety repertoire, Mm -hmm. um, especially because, you know, as you're bringing up, it it depends on the facility and what they're choosing to uh, what policy they're choosing to implement and how they want to address allergens. You know, like you said, some facilities are going completely nut free just to help reduce that risk of cross contamination or really just any exposure at all. And then some are more nut aware where they take precautions, but they're not fully banning all of it. And so it really, it depends on the facility and what they choose to do. And, and, you know, I can imagine as as a, you know, a parent with a child with a nut allergy or really any allergy food production and, you know, safely getting food to your child and those types of situations can be quite stressful. Yeah. I just wanted to raise that quick issue. So, because I know we have a lot of families who I get a little confused. Like one year the school is completely nut free. Then the next year they're not aware. So they, I guess they just wanted to be able to provide that type of information for them. But getting back to the, the topic at hand, what are some steps that we can take at home or anywhere to really keep our food safe? So in general, we have a, you know, easy four steps to food safety that we recommend for everybody to follow when they're at home preparing food and really any time that they're around food uh, or, you know, making food, whether it's at home or somewhere else. But those four steps are clean, separate, cook, and chill. And following these four steps is really going to, you know, reduce that risk of foodborne illness and getting foodborne illness, especially in your own home if you're preparing food. Clean means starting with clean hands, utensils, surfaces, you know, best way to start anything is to make sure everything's fully clean, you know, free of bacteria before you even start. As you start meal prepping, um, you also want to make sure you wash your hands and all of that throughout. So you're not spreading any bacteria to different places. And then especially after as well, you know, start with clean, end with clean, make sure everything is all clean, sanitized, free of bacteria before you continue. And separate. Before, before you get to the separate part, I think mm-hmm. it's real important to point out that I think a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the illnesses that the foodborne illnesses that are transferred happen at that stage when you're out of cross contamination because you're handling one thing, maybe raw chicken or with one thing. And then without, without washing your hands, you go into start prepping the vegetables. And that's an, exactly. easy, that's an easy way to transfer that bacteria. Exactly. We touch a lot of things <laughs> with yeah. our hands and, you know, by not hand washing and not being vigilant about what we've touched and then what we touch after, you're potentially spreading bacteria all over your kitchen. You know, we've done observational studies with consumers in a test kitchen and seen that rate of cross-contamination just be astounding. 
Um, you know, one year we did it and like 38% of spice containers or 30 something percent of spice containers got contaminated just by people preparing raw turkey and not washing their hands and touching the spice containers. So it is really something to be vigilant about. I heard heard a statistic about that a couple of months ago that the, probably the, the one item in the kitchen that is actually in the house, the item in the house that probably has the most bacteria on it are your spice jars Mm -hmm. because of that, that cross contamination. Exactly. So, you know, it's so easy to just touch something and not realize that you have with foodborne illness bacteria on your hand, you know, then you forget about it. You pick up that spice container to make something else. And then exactly like you said, you go to prepare your produce or your vegetables for dinner that aren't going to be cooked or your salad or something. And that's just how bacteria can move around your kitchen. So hand washing, making sure you're cleaning and sanitizing items is, is a huge way to reduce the bacterial contamination and risk of foodborne illness. Uh, sorry to get you off target. So we'll get back to the night. We did that. That's the clean. So what's this separate? Yep. No problem at all. Happy to go into detail because it's so important, yes. but um, separate is keeping raw meat and poultry products separate from any foods that are ready to eat. So it's exactly what we were just talking about with the cross contamination. Separate is all about preventing cross contamination, you know, not letting any bacteria from the juices or, you know, raw meat and poultry touch any other items, you know, use separate cutting boards. If you're preparing, you know, chicken tender, like grilled chicken tenders, let's say for your kid's lunch and you're, you know, chopping them up or you're getting them all seasoned on a cutting board and moving that over to the stove or to the oven to bake it. And then you want to prepare some sliced carrots. You can't use that same cutting board unless you fully clean and sanitize it. You can't use that same knife unless you fully clean and sanitize it. So things like that to keep in mind, you know, we even recommend using two different cutting boards. That way you're just keeping those items separate from the get go. You don't even have risk of cross contaminating unless you don't wash your hands or something like that. Um, Or, you know, recommend doing your produce items first and then your meat items last, or just again, fully cleaning and sanitizing those items, those those utensils, surfaces before you prepare something else to help prevent that cross-contamination from happening. And I know we talked about washing hands in between, but would wearing gloves help? Potentially. I always still like to say, wash your hands even after you've used gloves. My husband literally the other night was preparing a uh, ground turkey with gloves and was like, okay, th- took them off, threw them away. And I was like, you still got to wash your hands because there could be a hole or something in the glove that you don't know about, you know? So it's just, just always a best practice to wash your hands. Even after using gloves, it can help reduce obviously touching bacteria or touching that raw meat and, you know, potentially getting bacteria on your hands, but there could be little holes that you don't know about. Um, so better just to wash your hands anyways. Okay. And cook. Yes, super important, especially if you're going to be preparing um, foods for your kids to take to school that involve uh, meat, poultry, leftovers, you know, cooked foods that you're sending with them. Cook to a safe internal temperature as measured by a food thermometer is one of those topics and, you know, tidbits that we really try to ingrain in people. A lot of people rely on factors like sight, you know, the juices, you know, what color it is, how it feels to tell if a meat product is done cooking, but that is not a reliable way to tell if it's reached a safe internal temperature. We really recommend using a food thermometer. It's the easiest way to tell you just stick it in, wait till it, you know, reaches its level off you know, number of where it says the temperature of the food internally is. And that'll tell you exactly, you know, if it's reached a hot enough temperature to kill that bacteria or not. So using a food thermometer to cook to that safe internal temperature, best way to make your food safe. For, um, and, and, and it's purposes. funny, it's funny because I was going to ask you that, you know, not everybody walks around with a food th- thermometer in their pocket. Mm-hmm. So how, how, if, if there was a way to eyeball or to take a look at a food to see if it has reached its, its um, internal temperature, but obviously I guess the only way to do so is with that thermometer. Yep. I mean, we all know that as you cook meat and poultry, it changes color, you know, poultry will become no longer pink. Same thing with like ground beef or other meats and things. But there have been studies done that show that, you know, a pink burger has reached a full safe, you know, internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit, but one that was brown looking did not. So really, it's just, you know, a further testament to it's not a reliable way to tell. And the only way to do that is with a food thermometer. You know, if somebody doesn't have a food thermometer, we say, 
you know, do, do your best essentially <laughs> to, you know, not overcook food. Cause obviously then that's not desirable quality wise, but really overcook it to make sure it's, you know, become hot enough to fully kill that bacteria because undercooking food, especially if it's going to go in a lunchbox to school and then, you know, potentially not be at a safe temperature for a little bit, or even if it is at a fully safe temperature, you know, with cold sources and a lunchbox, eating undercooked food is a large way you can get foodborne illness. So it's better to make sure it's fully cooked. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service Specialist, Meredith Carruthers. And then there was a fourth category, the chill. Yes, chill. And this one comes uh, into play a lot when we're talking about packing a safe lunch and making sure food gets to school safely. Um, chill means keeping your foods at a safe temperature. So we all know we go grocery shopping. There are foods that are refrigerated and we got to get them in the refrigerator for them to stay safe. But really refrigeration is, is such a key factor when it comes to keeping foods safe. Foodborne illness causing bacteria don't tend to multiply or they don't multiply quick enough to cause an issue when they're at 40 degrees or below, which is the standard refrigerator temperature. Once they get above that 40 degrees, they can start multiplying, they can reach dangerous levels that then can produce toxins that are heat resistant. So that means if you leave something out for too long and it produces those toxins, you can't cook it and make it safe because those toxins then won't go away. So following things like the two hour rule by not leaving foods out at room temperature for more than two hours is super important. When it comes to packing lunches, that means that you can't send your kids to school with perishable food items if they're not going to be eating within two hours. So we really, for that, recommend using insulated lunch bags, cold sources like those frozen gel packs, frozen water bottles or juice boxes even. Something that provides a cold source to that food, keeps it nice and cold until lunchtime, and that way it's staying at a safe temperature. I'm glad you said it because I was actually going to ask you, when would be the ideal time to prepare a meal for their children? Should it, should they do it the night before or should they do it the day of, the, just before they go to school? When would be a, a great time to, to prepare that meal? So that can fall into personal preference. You know, I'm a big plan ahead, prepare ahead person. So I'm usually putting together my lunch for work the night before, putting it in the fridge, having all of my containers ready, my cold, you know, freezer packs in the freezer ready to go in the morning. And then I try and put it in my insulated container right before I leave. And then I am lucky to have a fridge at work. So, you know, for parents that are taking lunches to work um, or if kids have access to a fridge at school, putting it into the fridge immediately just as that extra precaution. But if you are going, you know, your kids, most kids are then keeping their lunchbox in their cubbies or in their backpacks or something until lunchtime. So really putting it in the lunchbox as late as possible until you leave is best, you know, put, gives it more time in the refrigerator before it goes into the lunchbox with your cold sources. But with an adequate amount of cold sources, you can make that lunch stay at a safe temperature until your kids eat, you know, five, six hours later. If you want to prepare things the night before, totally fine. Put them in the fridge. Just keep in mind with an insulated lunchbox, the insulated works on the outside too. So putting that in the fridge, make sure you keep it open so that way the cold air can circulate into the lunchbox. Don't put the sealed lunchbox in there because the refrigerator air won't get into the lunchbox, if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. That's actually a really good point. So because I'm sure a lot of people would close up, zip up the the lunchbox and put it inside the refrigerator, but then the food in, inside of it is not getting the any air circulated on it when you do that. So just leave it, leave the lid open when they have it in there. Mm-hmm, exactly. And then pull it out of the fridge, seal it up, send your kid to school with it. Now, what about parents? Any recommendations for those parents who want to try to send a some type of a warm meal? I don't want to say hot, but at least a warm meal for their children to have during lunchtime they send from home. Are those um, thermoses good for that? Or is there something else that they should use or not even go down that road? Because again, the temperature is going to vary so much between the time they leave school and actually eat it. Right. So unless you can really confirm that your thermos works well and you're sending them with something really hot, like a soup or something that will keep, you know hold heat pretty well, it's really best not to try and send hot food. Um, if you can confirm that a thermos works really well, you know, we even say put boiling hot water in the thermos 
for about five minutes before you then dump that water out and put the food inside. Because if you're starting with, you know, a hot thermos, like that has been made hot by that boiling water, it'll hold heat a lot longer than if you start with a cold one. As soon as you put that hot food in there, it's going to ultimately make that food a little bit colder. Um, so that's how we recommend trying to use the thermos, make it really, you know, put more boiling water in it, make it hot, then put your hot food in there. And if you can confirm that that food stays hot until lunchtime, fine to send it in that. But if there's, you know, if the food is dipping below 140 degrees for more than two hours or more than, you know, even an hour, it's just really tricky to make sure that that food does actually stay hot enough to stay safe until lunchtime. I noticed you you spoke about getting a an insulated lunchbox or an insulated bag. So what is the significance of using that insulated bag as opposed to using just a regular paper bag or even the old metal lunch boxes that we used to use? Mm -hmm. So the insulation will ultimately help keep that cold air in the lunchbox longer. When you have a paper bag, you know, or just like a grocery bag or, you know, something that's not going to help hold air very well, your food will get warm a lot faster. Even if you put a frozen, you know, water bottle in just a grocery bag, it's still going to thaw and become warm a lot faster than if it was in an insulated bag that's designed to help keep that air cold around the food for an appropriate amount of time. Since we're talking about that, talk to us about the, I guess, our back to school list. So what are some of the things that parents and caregivers should be thinking about, at including in that back to school shopping list? Definitely an insulated lunchbox or bag if you don't have one already. Um Cold sources like a frozen, you know, those frozen gel packs. I think they make, you know, really fun ones nowadays that either have like characters or things that are fun for the kids. There are, you know, little reusable ice cubes even that you can freeze and then they thaw out. Um, if you aren't able to do cold sources like that, water bottles, juice boxes, whatever drink you're sending your kids with, freeze them. And those can be used as a cold source, you know, even like a sports drink or something can be frozen and then that can be used as a cold source. It'll thaw out throughout the morning, be, you know, thawed by time lunchtime comes around and they can still drink that drink. Um, maybe, you know, non-perishable snack foods. So like crackers or other, you know, uh, snack baggies, trail mix, things that don't need to be refrigerated that can stay out at room temperature. We talked about allergies, but things like peanut butter and jelly are mm -hmm. a great, you know, non-perishable or like non-refrigerated item that you can also send if they're, you know, going to be without refrigeration or without the ability to keep their lunch cold for the entire day. So things like that are things that you can add to your list that are super easy to, you know, be able to make a safe lunch, a food thermometer if you don't already have one. <laughs> I'm sure I know the answer. I know the answer to this question, but I want our, our listeners to know it as well. How often should those insulated lunch boxes be cleaned out? Ideally, every time you use them, <laughs> but definitely once a week, I would say, you know, it also depends if you're sending everything that's like packaged and wrapped and nothing has spilled. Totally fine. But obviously, if there's any spills, better to clean up as soon as it happens or that same day. Um, yeah, just as often as you can, really. And, and I know now that there's a big push um, or I've seen a lot of people carry like their own straws with them. So that we, because we don't want to use plastic straws a lot and the paper ones kind of just they, they get a little bit too flimsy sometimes. So they end up coming with their own metallic straws or something like that. How often do we need to, to clean those? Out? And is there a special way that they need to be cleaned? So similar to the lunch bags, really, as often as you can, you know, especially in something like that, where you are actively putting your mouth on it, you are drinking through it. Um, if it doesn't have time to dry, I know there's like foldable ones that go in a little carrying case that don't properly get a chance to dry most times, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, bacteria really can thrive in those dark, moist environments. So really as often as you can, I think a lot of them come with a brush that helps you actually get in there and scrub versus just rinsing it out. So using dish soap, ability, you know, yeah, dish soap to fully wash and scrub out any potential bacteria that's there is the way to go. And, you know, really as often as possible. Going back to the food preparation itself, I know a lot of people uh, tend to think that if they marinate their food or if they leave it soaking in um, in vinegar for a long period of time, either overnight or for a couple of hours, that that's going to help to kill the bacteria. Is 
True or false? False, ultimately. <laughs> so it's possible that it might reduce the bacterial load, which means like the amount of bacteria on it some, but it's not going to get it all. And really the only sure way to do that is to fully cook your food and to make sure it's reached that safe internal temperature with your food thermometer. So, you know, it's it's possible that that might help some, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to get all of the bacteria. So still would recommend fully cooking. And again, the importance of using that food thermometer. I know, again, a lot of experienced cooks and, and people around the house tend to go by time. So well, if I if it cooks for 30 minutes at 350 degrees, then that should be fine. Or if you go to 45 minutes at 350 or, or something like that, then that should be fine. No use of food thermometer. Yes. Food thermometers for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Where can our listeners go to, I guess, get more information about the food safety tips? So we have a really great website that we uh, work on in conjunction with CDC and FDA, the other federal entities that work on food safety topics, and it's called foodsafety.gov. So we have a ton of information on there about many food safety topics, but specifically we have back to school information on there. We also have information on our specific website, which is www.fsis, so that's Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS, at USDA, I'm sorry, .usda.gov. So fsis.usda.gov. It's a mouthful, but we have a lot of great information there as well. We also have a meat and poultry hotline, which is a live hotline uh, with food safety specialists like myself available to answer any questions, walk through your back to school list, you know, talk through any situations you have or your children had with food or taking a lunch to school and maybe it sat out for too long, things like that. We have our specialists available to help answer any questions. You can give us a call at 1-888-MP-HOTLINE. So that's 1-888-674-6854. You can also live chat with us at ask.usda.gov um, or send us an email at mphotline at usda.gov. We are available 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Wow, that's a lot of information to to digest, but it's also a lot of good information to help to try to help keep us all healthy, especially since we have a lot of students who are in school, they're in they're in sports and in other clubs, so they have to stay properly uh with, with proper nutrition and hydration throughout the day, and this is something really important for them to know. Absolutely. And and like you mentioned, especially for kids that are in sports or doing after school activities, if there's a snack being packed for them, make sure it's a non-perishable snack, doesn't need refrigeration, unless they have access to a refrigerator or something to help keep that food cold throughout the entire day. Cold sources will help keep food safe till lunchtime, often not the full day through the evening. So think about perishable or I'm sorry, non-perishable, non-refrigerated needed snacks. Great. So we definitely want to, if you had to give us, I guess, one really quick tip on how to keep the importance of keeping food safe, what would that tip be? When it comes to school and packing lunches for school, cold sources and keeping lunches cold if you're sending perishable items. For food preparation in general, I think we touched a lot on cross-contamination and hand washing and making sure you're keeping your hands and surfaces clean so you don't spread bacteria around the kitchen. Well, we would certainly and like, a food thermometer <laughs> and a food thermometer, the important thing of all. But we would certainly like to thank our guest today, USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service Specialist Meredith Carruthers, for coming on to our show. Thanks so much for having me. Pack some safe lunches this year. Once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the Voice of Nassau Community College, ninety point three WHPC.